Uh, yep, so I'm, I'm David Smith uh, from Microsoft. And today I'm going to talk about another way you can, uh, another thing you can do to make your R programs run faster. Uh, rather than, I mean, and one alternative as we just saw was to use a, a faster interpreter. Um, you could do sensible things like vectorizing your R code. Uh, but in this talk, I'm going to suggest you just throw a whole bunch of hardware at the problem. Uh, run, uh, get a, a, a PC with lots of CPUs, get a cluster of machines, and run bits of your R code in parallel to speed it up that way. And there are lots of parallel programming tools that exist in R to help you to do that. Uh, we saw a very sophisticated one from Helena at the beginning of the session today. Uh, there's the parallel package in R. There is the futures package, which is very new and modern and sophisticated. Uh, but I'm going to be focusing on one particular package, which is called the ForEach package. You might be familiar with it. It's been on CRAN for at least 10 years now. Um, but the ForEach package was designed to be dead simple, to make it really easy to get into doing parallel programming. And in the talk today, I'm going to talk, I'll show you an extension to the ForEach package, which similarly makes it dead simple to take the code that you're running in R and run it in parallel on a cluster of machines that you spun up in the cloud and in our case specifically the Azure cloud. So let's see how that works. First of all, I told you for each is dead simple and it applies to a dead simple kind of parallel programming problem and that's the embarrassingly parallel kind. Basically it's that situation where you have a very simple loop where one iteration of the loop doesn't depend on the previous one and they can be run independently. Uh, common situations like that are say um, um, uh, by group analyses if you want to run an analysis or report for different chunks of data, you could run each of those chunks in parallel, for example, and speed things up that way. The important thing, though, is that each of those chunks of calculation, either the iterations of the loop or the calculations on a piece of the data, run in a somewhat significant, decent amount of time. And that's kind of very hand-wavy by deliberate. But things that run in milliseconds, you probably not get, get much benefit in parallelizing because there's some overhead with distributing them among, amongst different computational concepts. Um, but if everything takes a second, 10 seconds, a minute, an hour, you're going to get some benefits from parallelizing that. So let me motivate that with an example, uh, one that I'm sure many of you are very familiar with from your statistics classes. Um, let's have a look at the birthday paradox. Given a number of people, let's say n, in a room, what's the probability that at least two people in that room share the same birthday. And I'm sure you know that there's a, there's a fairly simple uh, um, calculation you can do to figure that out. Um, you can calculate it for 300 people in the room and it's almost going, certainly going to be there. Actually, I can't see my cursor. So here's the calculation for 100 people, basically 100% probability that somebody's going to share a birthday then. There's only two people in the room. It's going to be a fairly low probability. And the paradox is that if there's between 25 and 26 people in the room, um, there's about a 50-50 chance of somebody sharing the same birthday, uh, which is kind of surprising if you're not familiar with statistics. Now, in fact, R has a function built into R itself to make that calculation. It's called pBirthday. Um, it's very fast, um, so it's not very suitable for this parallelization problem before. So I thought I'd just complicate things and write a function to do that calculation manually and the way this function works is it takes the number of people in the room, simulates n people in that room with a birthday number between 1 and 365, and then does that calculation, in this case 100,000 times, to make it take a long time, and then average out the results. By the way, I've been giving this talk for quite a long time. Uh, 4-H has been around for a while, and every time I give that talk, I have to add an extra zero to that number of simulations because computers keep on getting faster so that I can keep this calculation slow enough to make it interesting to parallelize. But anyway, the basic um, calculation to get that chart we saw on the previous slide was to do that calculation for n equals 2, 3, 4, up to 100. Oh, so in fact, I did it from 1 here. Um, so you just loop over from 1, 2, 3, 4 to 100, make that calculation, and then return back the results. So now let's have a look how we can speed up that calculation using parallel programming. Before I do that, though, I just want to note that when I do this sequential calculation, just using traditional R and the S apply function, that takes about three minutes on this laptop um, using that slow version of the function that I mentioned. To convert that to a parallel computation, all we need to do is use this for each function. 
Uh, first of all, you have to load the 4-H package from CRAN, but after, you, after you've done that, you get a function that's very similar to the for loop in, R, in base R itself. Um, you specify the thing you want to li li loop over as a vector, so n goes from 1 to 100 for us, and the code you want to run. Now, that can be a braced expression with as much code as you like. In our, ca in our situation, we're just going to do one function call to that birthday simulator function we saw a minute ago. And then we're separating this with an operator called do par. And as that, the name of that operator suggests, it's going to make it really easy for us to parallelize that computation. But basically, you can think of that for each call, as you see it though there, as very similar to the sapply function that we used in the previous slide. And in fact, it gives back, as sapply does, a vector of the results, one per calculation for each of the iterations in that loop. Uh, by the way, if you want to have a look up all the documentation for Forage, it's available online at the link you can see on the slide right there. Now, if you just run Forage straight out of the box after you've, after you've installed the package and loaded it, things will happen just as they do for the sapply function. Things will happen sequentially, one iteration after the other. And it won't make any difference to how fast things run. It would still take three, second, three minutes, rather, on this laptop. But the way 4-H is designed is if you can declare a backend before you make that 4-H call. And that backend describes how the iterations of the loop are parallelized and, and with parameters describing how many of them are run at a time. So the default, as I mentioned, is sequential. Uh, but for example, you could do this register do MC function uh, on uh, Linux and Mac machines. Tell it how many iterations to run in parallel. And typically, you'd say to do as many as I have CPUs or cores on this particular machine. And 4-H will take care of all the details of farming out individual processes to each of those cores. It'll even take care of the details of if you refer to variables in that bit of code that you're parallelizing to make sure that those variables are available in each of the sub R sessions that get spawned. Um, I mentioned the future package earlier on. You can also access the capabilities of the future package as a back end to the for each uh, function, which gives you access to some really nice features of the future package for dealing with some high performance computing schedulers, uh, specifically LSF, Open Lava, and Slurm. And so you can just have your code farmed out to those computing uh, clusters uh, using that technique right there. The one I'm going to focus on here, though, is one that we have developed and made available uh, on GitHub. It's called Register Azure, uh, Register Azure Parallel, which, as the name suggests, will take the code that you've declared as part of your forage loop and run it in a cluster that it automatically spins up for you in the Azure cloud. So let's have a look how that works in a second. One thing I want to emphasize, though, is that whichever backend you choose to use, the code you use in the for each call itself remains exactly the same. You don't have to adjust your code depending on how it's parallelized. And in fact, if you want to switch from, say, sequential processing to parallel processing in, cluster, in a cluster, all you need to do is change the backend call that you do before you actually do the loop. All right, let's have a look at some examples here. Um, the parallel package I mentioned as well, if you want to use that with for each, you can just call library do parallel and to declare your backend. Then you'll use this make cluster to describe uh, how many local, how many cores, how many workers rather you want to use for the local cluster. In this case, I'm using two. And then you register the backend as you have here, register do parallel with our parameterized cluster. And then it's exactly the same code as we had before but now it's running in parallel, in this case with two iterations on a t at a time, using our built-in parallel package. And one of the nice things about the parallel package, by the way, is it works on all platforms, Windows, Mac, and Linux. Let's take it a step further. Let's suppose that I had a, a big machine with 16 cores. I don't on this particular laptop, but I could easily spin up a single virtual machine in the cloud of my choice. And having logged into that virtual machine, I can use the doMC library, which declares another backend to for each. I define my cluster. I haven't uh, included the code to do that, but I specify in the cluster that it's going to run 16 iterations at once, once per core, running the same code once again. And you can see that instead of the three minutes that it took on my local laptop to do this calculation, when I run it with 16 iterations at a time on this slightly more powerful machine, that time goes down to 21 seconds. So that's a pretty significant 
uh, improvement in the speed without really writing any additional code to make that happen. Um, so I mentioned already that that reduction is about 11 times faster compared to the sequential computation. Uh, one thing to mention, by the way, for anybody who uses uh, a multi-threaded BLAS, um, I'm not talking about that in this particular talk, but there are ways in R to say have a matrix operation use multiple cores at the same time. Good idea to turn that off if you're going to do any of this kind of coarse grain parallelization. Really? I got five and I got nine in mine, doesn't matter. Okay. Um, so anyway, the, the bit that I wanted to show you here in this talk is let's take it a step further and rather than running that computation in one machine, let's actually generate a cluster of machines and then distribute those computations across the cluster. Um, this is another package, as I mentioned, available on GitHub called Do Azure Parallel, which will generate that cluster for you in the Azure cloud. And then you can use 4-H, as we have already seen, seen to, to farm out those computations out into the components of that cluster. And typically, you will run multiple iterations on each of those clusters according to how many CPUs are available on each of those virtual machines. So here's how it works. First of all, we have to um, decide how big of a cluster we want and how powerful we want each of those machines to be. Um, so in this particular case, I'm going to do an eight node cluster and each of those machines are going to be two CPU machines uh, with seven gigabytes of RAM. There's a particular um, virtual machine standard that's available to do that. I'm not going to go through the details here, but the way you specify that is with a little file called cluster.json, which describes the type of virtual machine you want to use for each of the cluster nodes and the actual size of the node of the cluster itself. Once you've defined that file, it's pretty much as we've seen already. We load our backend library. We load in the file which defines the size of the cluster. We make that cluster, or register the back end, and then it's exactly the same code as we saw before. Um, when I run that, um, that computation takes 45 seconds. Um, so that's five times faster uh, than on my local machine. And you might have noticed that's a little bit slower in Fract than running on a really big single machine. There is, again, some additional overhead to distributing across multiple machines as opposed to one single machine. But if you have a really big job that can't be contained within one machine, this kind of thing can really help. Now, that's a pretty contrived example uh, with, the, with the birthday function. I want to give you something a little bit more practical. Um, if you're using the carrot package, um, I'm sure people have seen Max Green around here, uh, written a really, really good package for doing all sorts of machine learning and predictive modeling. One of the thing, one of the features Carrot has is the ability to cross-validate the hyperparameters uh, for each of the uh, machine learning models. And basically, you just define a grid of values to test all the different hyperparameters on, and then you pick the, mod, the one that optimizes the model in the way that you define. Um, one of the really nice things that Max has done with the Carrot package is that if you define a parallel backend to the 4-H package, just load one of those parallel backends and define it, without taking any additional steps at all, when you do cross-validation like this with Carrot, the Carrot package will automatically do that in parallel. It's really, really nice. Um, and so all you need to do then is just define the model using the, the way you do traditionally in Carrot. I'm not going to go through all the details here. And in our case, what we did was just registered uh, a backend cluster in Azure using, as we saw a minute ago, and then Carrot took care of all the details of sending all the data and the models over to the cluster, doing the computations and returning the results back. One thing I haven't mentioned yet is that you do have the ability to use what are called low priority nodes as the components of your cluster. Uh, probably the most, in thing, most important thing to know about low priority nodes is that they cost about 80% less of traditional nodes with the very, very slight risk that they might be taken away from you at any time if the load on the system gets high. It happens very infrequently, but even if it does, um, the do Azure parallel package will basically recognize that as just a failed job and run it again on a different job, on a different node of the cluster, rather. So you won't notice anything happened, except it takes a little bit longer than it would have done otherwise. And there's a simple way to configure that in the cluster.json file. So um, in terms of the speed ups that we got, we can have a look at uh, a blog post that Max did last week, uh, last year rather, um, doing those computations on a single machine. But I'll skip ahead and show how we did it on a multiple machine with eight nodes.
half of them were low priority and half of them were regular priority nodes. And when I ran that cross-validation on my laptop, that took 78 minutes. And this is a case where running on a cluster really helped and wouldn't fit onto a single machine. It ran about five times faster um, and just in 16 minutes. How much does all this cost? Um, one of the nice things is you only pay for the time you use in the cluster because it automatically shuts it down when you're finished. And if you know, use these low priority nodes that I mentioned, it's even cheaper still. That particular computation that took uh, 16 minutes on the cluster cost about 32 cents. So that's it. Um, all the information you can find are on the slides, which you can find at that link right there. As I mentioned, the 4-H package is available on CRAN now. Um, if you want to do that birthday simulation, um, I've put all the code of that available on a blog post. Uh, I mentioned the docs already. Uh, the do Azure Parallel package is available for download now on GitHub. Um, if you do want to do that cluster computation in Azure with the do Azure Parallel package, you will need to have an Azure subscription. Uh, but if you haven't had one yet, um, new subscribers can get $200 in free credits to use as they wish, and you can find a link to get that credit right there. And that's it. Thanks very much. Yeah, the, the question was, how does the, how does the 4-H handle package dependencies when you're only specifying it in a single function? It does it, it's best to find objects, but if it relies on functions from other packages, it won't know about that by default. One thing I didn't mention for lack of time is in that cluster.json file, um, you can also specify other packages that get to be loaded on those individual machines. And those packages can either be on CRAN or in GitHub. Uh, there's a syntax to do that. Another thing that I also didn't have time to mention is you can also specify your own Docker image that will run on each of those nodes in the cluster. And of course, you can make anything available in that Docker image that you like. Thanks. Yeah, the, the question was, how does the cluster communication between those, those packages happen compared to other packages, and is it as fast? The actual inter-process communication is actually handled by Azure Batch, which is the HPC computing service that's provided by Azure itself. Um, it's not super fast in terms of that inter-process communication, which is why it really works best for these embarrassingly parallel situations where you don't have a lot of inter-process communication. If you're getting to that kind of sort of level of computation, I'd actually recommend having a look at some of the other um, a parallel programming packages, like that one Helena was showing us earlier on. Um, it works really best for these more simple, you know, embarrassing parallel things that uh, are relatively easy to parallelize. Uh, David, if your uh, program is composed of web, um, if your program is composed of um, different components, some of them can be parallelized, some of them cannot. How do you? make it happen end to end. So mm. like the middle component, I can use a parallel, but the beginning and the end, I can't. So how to do that if that's the case? Yeah, good question. You can actually, in the same way that you can use multiple for loops in a big script that does some sort of non-parallel stuff between them, same things works here. You can have several calls to for each through a script, and in between those calls, you have all that offline, non-parallel computation that's doing to prepare each one. Is that what you meant? Yes. Yep. Okay, thanks. Any more questions? Looks like. Um, oh. What happens if I set up a big job and then my computer crashes? Do I have to wait, like, does it, does it really just carry on and finish, or is there any way to cancel it? Yeah, the question was, what happens if my computer crashes in the middle of a big job? You know, how can I pick it up? The answer is, yeah, you can pick it up because all of that's happening on that remote cluster at that time. And there's functions that do Azure Parallel to, to get back to a cluster after the time. And then all the results will be there waiting for you in Azure Batch and it'll just bring them down. It's kind of, yeah. So, all right. So let's thanks um, David again. Thank you.